Okay. Uh, good afternoon <coughs> and welcome to today's uh, lunchtime lecture. Uh, I'm Paul McMillan. I'm a professor in the chemistry department and I'm a member of the lunchtime lecture committee and I'm the host for today. So, before we begin, a couple of practicalities. Um, we have uh, a live uh, streaming audience uh, watching the lecture from outside. And so, if members of that audience wish to ask a question, then you can use the Slido website uh, with access code 9891, or else uh, send uh, a Twitter um, to Emma, who will then ask questions on your behalf at the end. Um, so, today's lecture is going to be given by Professor Sebastien Ursula, who, is, uh, who moved from Australia to UCL in 2007. He's uh, one of the directors of the Translational Imaging Group and Professor of Medical Image Computing in the Faculty of Engineering Sciences. He's also involved in dementia research, using imaging to guide surgery and treatment in collaboration with the Institute of Neurology in Queen Square. And so today, he's going to be speaking to us about uh, helping use uh, software techniques to navigate the brain and guide surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. <laughs> Thanks for joining us uh, for uh, this lunchtime uh, lunch hour lecture. Um, so um, I'm going today to, uh, to discuss about uh, my uh, present work on uh, image guided neurosurgery for epilepsy. I would like first to make a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not a neurosurgeon, I'm not a neurologist, I'm actually an engineer. I did my PhD on medical image analysis in France before, to move, before moving in Australia. Um, and I did my PhD actually in the area of uh, image guided neurosurgery as well. Um, and I'm uh, what I'm calling myself a healthcare engineer. And uh, I'm as well the director at UCL of a newly formed institute called the Institute of uh, Healthcare Engineering. <clears throat> so, um, I would like to first um, give a very, very simple ex um, explanation about what is really epilepsy, even if it's actually very, still a very obscure um, uh, disease, uh, very hard to understand in great detail, but it's one of the most serious uh, neurological conditions, um, and um, it's actually based on, on um, an abnormal burst of the neurons, uh, so we've got lots of neurons in your brain, and uh, they communicate to each other by sending a, an electrical signal, uh, and sometimes it happens that uh, this electrical signal is abnormal um, and creates a burst of firing, and this firing is generating this seizure, uh, which, uh, which we can, you can visually uh, quite often uh, see on the patient. And uh, it's quite fascinating to actually realize that there is over 40 different seizures um, of, of epilepsy. <clears throat> So just to give you an idea of the, of the size of the problem, um, there is um, over 50 million people affected by epilepsy across the globe. Uh, there is um, uh, an incidence of one over 20. It's actually much, common that, much more common than one, one might think. Uh, there is over 30,000 new cases uh, in the UK um, every year. Um, and uh, there is a prevalence of nearly half a million of uh, people uh, within the country. Um, two-thirds of those cases can actually be um, um, uh, dealt with using anti-epileptic drugs. So I'm using the acronym AED in my next slides. Um, and out of those uh, different numbers, uh, 150,000 of those are considered as very serious cases. Um, and quite a lot of those are cases where AEDs will not work, will not make any difference to the patient. Um, and, and identifying where seizure comes from within your brain is one of the most fundamental aspects of being able to identify the right treatment. Uh, finding the seizure and the localization of the seizure in the brain is a very active clinical area. Um, I'm just presenting briefly how the brain looks like. I do apologize, the, the quality is not as good as on my slide. I hope it will be okay for the, for the talk. Uh, but to give an idea of what, how the brain looks like, that look like this. This was uh, 3D printed by one of our colleagues at the back of the room. Uh, this is pretty much at the human scale. It's 80% size. Uh, there is an echo on my microphone. 
Um, and um, it was actually uh, the brain, or it is still, the brain of one of our scientists in the lab. Uh, but that gives you, I think, a good idea about how it looks like. And there is some different parts of the brain that, uh, which are linked with functions. And uh, one of them, uh, for instance, in this case here, uh, is actually directly linked um, uh, with um, the sensory area, uh, and which can, uh, which can, for instance, for some cases of epilepsy, uh, be an area which is affected. And in this case, using uh, a technology called uh, functional MRI, which is a, a way of identifying some function using uh, magnetic resonance imaging, we, we were able to identify where the uh, epileptic um, uh, focus was coming from and use it eventually for resection for this patient. Sometimes the information can be visible as well on the MR itself without functional information, uh, which is the case here. Uh, and we were able to identify exactly where the uh, focus was coming from. Another case is, um, in, in, other, in other situation, you might actually want to use what we call electroencephalography, EEG. Uh, so you might have seen that before. That's a cap that uh, uh, you have the patient to wear. Uh, there is a lot of channel on it. And you will be able to monitor, to record the electrical activity of the brain. Because it's, it's up on top of your head, it's, there is a skull in between. The signal is quite poor. Uh, the specificity is not that great. And it will be mainly on the neocortex, so which means at the surface of the, of the, of the brain. Uh, and in this case, uh, we, uh, we will have the challenge of trying to understand those signals. And they are really fundamental to understand epilepsy. Uh, and so quite often, it just happens that those signals are not enough uh, to actually identify uh, the focus. And you need to have far more um, uh, in-depth information of what is happening in the brain. And for the case where we cannot really identify it properly, um, um, the, the main way of looking at it will be by uh, implanted electrode in the brain. And usually you do that uh, to be able to uh, localize more refinely where the focus is coming from. And usually the idea will be then that you will be able to resect this part of the brain. It just happens that surgery is can be curative. So for this 30% of this population where these anti-epileptic drugs will not work, this is really why you do this very uh, invasive uh, clinical uh, investigation, then the surgical treatment can be curative. It can be. It's not, all the ca it's not always the case, and it's not going to work for every single patient. If the uh, focus of the epilepsy is actually um, not only in one location, it could be distributed across the brain, uh, you might not be able to intervene. It might be too risky for the patient. Um, but some, in some cases, uh, it's actually um, um, uh, absolutely curative, and the patient will not have any seizure, will be seizure-free for the rest um, of their life. Uh, so really, one of the key uh, technologies there to really understand what is happening deep in the brain is to use what we call uh, intracranial electrodes. So there is two types of those things. One is um, the one on the left here, which are grids, and the one on the right, which are SEEG for, for Quite a very long word, if you play Scrabble, uh, stereo electroencephalography. I don't know how many points you make with that, but I'm sure you make a lot of points. Um, and so that's those things on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, I've got one of them here, uh, if you want to have a look and to show around. Um, and um, and those, those electrodes um, are, need to be inserted very precisely in the brain. Um, and it's actually quite a, it's been quite a revolution in terms of technology. It hasn't been used for so many years. Uh, one of the first implantations uh, within Queen Square at UCL was, was done in around 2010. Um, but it makes a huge difference in terms of the type of signal you can extract from the brain. So it's like an EEG, like a cap, but except that the points are not, the contact are not on the skull. They are actually in the brain. And so what you do, if you know where to put them, like I present here, you have many electrodes in the brain of this patient. Uh, you can get those type of signal. So what you see here, it's actually a seizure happening, right? So there is a very quiet time. Um, uh, and then after there is this huge <coughs> phase, which we call in, in epilepsy the ictal phase, so the, the ictal period, the period when the brain is actually um, um, uh, firing up, having this burst, um, which leads to um, a seizure. I'm going to show you an example of uh, one of our patients uh, who kindly agreed to have this video uh, presented to the public, um, where we had to do this implantation in the brain. Um, so this lady, Katie, um, had up to 15 seizures a day. 
uh, at this, at this moment of seizure, I can be believe that, that actually completely ruin your life. And there is some very specific. Uh, um, no, ma. Can you remember number one? one um, um, okay, can you remember number one from at least two types of seizures actually happen? Okay. I described on the left hand side. Actually, using the clinical report, really. What here, is there is a, a, a clinic in its left arm happening. And there is as well a follow up of okay. a seizure. And you could see a arm being distributed. It's stretching. What the nurse is doing here, while the seizure is happening, asking this lady, asking Katie to uh, remember things. To, and all of this information helps the electrophysiologist, the neurologist, and the neurosurgeons to make a decision about where this epileptic uh, focus uh, is coming from in the brain. And, and if it's an area that could be resected, then indeed, indeed this person would be eligible for surgery. Unfortunately, not so many patients are eligible for surgery, and the main reason of that the threshold is so high is already from the perspective of the safety. I'm sure that you will appreciate that being able to put an electrode in the brain of a, of a, of a human uh, body is not such a great idea. Um, you will not do that um, without having a very good reason. And when you start to put 12 or 16 of those, uh, then you really need to understand <laughs> precisely where you are, you are going to locate them, where are you going to put them. And this is really where all science, computer science and, and uh, healthcare engineering is really making uh, uh, a difference uh, into this field. So what I'm, uh, I'm presenting here is actually the, the, the final product, the final endpoint of being able to help our neurologists, our neurosurgeons to have the right trajectory in the brain to put the electrode at the right place and put it safely and why I'm talking about safety here, there is lots of blood vessels in the brain. You've got major arteries, you've got major uh, vessels, and if one of those electrodes is touching uh, one of these arterial vessels, then it could lead to a major infarct, uh, which uh, can have a huge morbidity uh, for, uh, associated with a, with, a, uh, with a surgery. So This is really something that you want to avoid. Something as well we want to, to avoid is, is spending too much time on each patient, both from the implantation uh, but as well for the, for, the, um, uh, for the planning. A planning of such kind uh, can take many, many, many hours, if not multiple sessions over, over, over many weeks to actually identify really what are the right part of the brain that you need to probe and, and where you should put all those electrodes. So, so what we've been working on is helping to build a, a map, a 3D map of the brain for clinicians to help them to identify really what would be the safety, the most uh, safest trajectory for every single of those electrodes. So the first part of the work we've been doing under this, what we call epilep epilepsy navigation system, so EPINAV, uh, has been um, a strategy of developing a patient-specific model, so getting this thing on the computer, getting an understanding of the different level of the brain, and as well getting an understanding of the position of those, of those vessels in those arteries, and as well, far more information can be added. It could, it could come from molecular imaging information, it could come from functional imaging, uh, and it could even come from uh, diffusion imaging when we talk about the white matter of the brain. So the epilepsy uh, is a disease of the gray matter, uh, but uh, to connect your different gray matter in the brain, there is white matter in between, which are those fibers. And you want actually to know sometimes the, inf the information of those fibers. Um, and I will, uh, I will show you an example why this is so important. So really the first phase for us is to build a 3D model of the brain, which is patient-specific. So we've been developing <coughs> in our lab a technology based mainly on, on, on machine learning, which enables us to take an MRI image, so magnetic resonance image of the brain. It's a non-invasive um, technique uh, where you can get 3D information um, of, of every single part of the brain. So resolution is not fantastic, but it's still pretty good. It's not as good as uh, looking at histology, but you can still go to a roughly one by one by one millimeter for each of your voxel on your, on your, on your picture, on your image. And so what we we're able to do is to go from this to a brain which is what we call parcelated, when every single part of the brain has a label. And so once you've got that, well, then you can start to actually look at the anatomy of this patient in 3D, and you can build this very nice 3D map, which can be decomposed, and then you can, you can have an associated label for all of them. And so for instance, if you had a patient with, um, um, uh, which has a, um, uh, an area of the brain affected, let's say for instance, that there is a belief from the electrophysiologist that the left hippocampus the temporal horn of the left hippocampus is, is involved, 
uh, then you would like to actually <coughs> insert an electrode here. And by having the information of the label, then you can do that far more safely. And you can do that in a reproduci reproducible manner. Another very important part of information that you want to have, as I mentioned, are vessels and arteries. So there is new other technique as well using magnetic resonance imaging, which are um, <coughs> called magnetic resonance venography, when you can actually build a 3D map, uh, both um, um, of the arteries, but as well of the vessels. So we've got the arteries here, we've got the vessels here, and you can build these 3D, these 3D models about where are all of those different um, 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 uh, vessels and arteries going through in your brain. You can combine them, and then now, if you put all of this information together, then you've got a 3D map of the brain that you can use to really assess uh, the topology uh, in three dimension. Another area that you really want to avoid are actually the, um, the sulci within the brain. So the brain has a lot of convolution that you can see here. And in between them, you've got, you've got um, uh, for instance, a sulcus here. And, and this, this ridge here that you have, this hole you have, there is blood vessel in it as well at the bottom of it. So if you were actually putting an electrode there, you might burst one of them, so you want to avoid that. So we try to be, as we call, as, as far as we can from them, and therefore um, uh, being uh, on the different gyri. And so what we've been doing is putting all of this information together into one single software and providing a very intuitive way for clinicians to be able to pick part of the brain and to state, well, I want an electrode on this point. Is this anatomical area or this other anatomical area? I'm just going to show very briefly the software. So here what you have is a patient that we want to implant. We've got different area of interest here. We can superimpose um, uh, uh, the veins uh, and the arteries. Um, and then we can identify a set of targets. Uh, we can identify uh, some specific um, um, uh, constraint in terms of the distance from the sulci. Uh, we can identify as well constraint related to the skull itself. Uh, so you want, when you want to drill uh, in a skull, you want to be as perpendicular as possible of the skull, otherwise the drill might slip. Uh, so you, you, can, you can as well add this constraint into, into your algorithms. Uh, so we push the compute button, and it took approximately less than a minute to build a 3D plan of all of those electrodes. And so what we can guarantee the surgeon is as long as we've got all of this anatomy well described, then we can guarantee that this is the best estimate of what should be the position of those electrodes. So then the next stage for, um, for clinicians, so if you just consider that there is a skin on this, so that's a clamp uh, that you have on a neurosurgical table for your patient. Uh, that's a 3D printed model of the skull of a patient that we implanted before, and we identified what was the best trajectory. And what you want to do is we want to put these screws in the brain which I can't even unscrew myself. Um, you want to put this screw in the brain, and the main reason of this is, and you want to put then this bolt, and this will help you to guide this electrode I show you, right? And then you can put this electrode within it. This electrode, as you could see, is very soft, so what usually we do is we do a, a hole which is slightly bigger, and, and we put a stylet in it, which we can use as a guide, right, for the, for the electrode, okay? And that's how actually your head is going to be fixed if you have any, any, any day a neurosurgical intervention on your head, right? So that's um, uh, called a mayfield uh, with a U-shape, and that's a clamp. And then your, your head doesn't move then from the table. Yeah. I'm not going to pass this around. It's a bit heavy and quite fragile and quite expensive, so I will leave it here. Um, but I hope that gives you an idea about how it could look like. Um, it's great to have a great plan and to know exactly what you want to do. It's another thing to implement it. Uh, that's uh, basically the difference between a strategy and an implementation of a strategy. Uh, and so what we need to, to know now is how we're going to implant it properly. And what we do to, for the implantation is we use other type of technology, which are mainly around robotic. So um, we've been working very closely uh, with a neurosurgeon from uh, Austria um, uh, called Dr. Stefan Wolfsberger. Uh, who was one of the um, uh, pioneer neurosurgeons on using some of this new robotic solution. And so what we want to do now is help our neurosurgeon to make sure that if we tell them this is where we want to go, that the electrode will go exactly where we want. So we want to assist the surgeon in terms of the best trajectory to go into the brain. 
And what is actually quite nice is not only we improve the accuracy by using a robot during the intervention, but as well we reduce the time of the surgery. Those type of surgery are very lengthy. And there is a huge long waiting list for patients to be treated and to be implanted. If we can save time and we can improve accuracy, we're definitely going to improve not only the outcome for this patient we implant, we implant now, but we, we are going to improve the outcome for the patient which might be implanted more quickly. So less time, le less waiting time between patients. So um, this is our lab. This is actually um, um, 50 meters away from this lecture theater where we have basically the full replica of what you will have in an operating room. Uh, this is what we call a stealth station, uh, which is uh, the device you use in a neurosurgical theater uh, to be able to track and to be able to guide you. Uh, this is a real operating table. This is not a patient, that's a phantom. Uh, this here, the U-shape here, this is what I show you here, that's a clamp. And on top of the clamp, you've got these four points here, which are this thing here, right? which I will explain a bit later. That's a tracking device. I will let you know after what it is and how it works. And, and this here is actually the, the, the front end of this small thing here, which is a robot. And this robot as well needs to be calibrated. So I'm going to use this for calibration quite a bit and tracking quite a bit. And so what we have to do, for instance, is to use this tool here to calibrate it. And I will, I will show you later how we do that. So the next year, next, next slide, that's a real patient this time, just not a phantom. Uh, we cannot recognize the patient. Uh, what we have to do is to make sure that um, uh, the patient is fixed to the table so that you know the table is not moving. So you can use that as your reference point uh, if you want to know the 3D localization inside the brain. You've got your clamp with the head of the patient on it. Um, so that's fixed. So now what you're going to do is to be able to explain to the system how to link your navigation software, your navi navigation tech system, this tell station, with your patient to be able to have your sat nav, your navigation technology, that each time you know that if you go into the brain, you know exactly where you go. And that's done by using this system of cameras. You have two cameras here. These are uh, infrared cameras. And, and the way that it works is you've got those tools I mentioned before, and I just put one of them as well, um, when you've got these little balls here, right? And these little balls, they're going to reflect. And basically what you will have is they will reflect the infrared light like you will see for the cats in overnight, right? And so basically what you can do now, if you've got two cameras, you can, with a very simple mathematical formulation, you can do triangulation. I'm looking at the same object from two different views. I've got information from those two different views about where I think this object is in 3D and I can use a mathematical framework to actually tell me exactly where this point is in space, right? And that's a very common way of identifying where an object is, um, and it's used by many, by many types of technology. This is why my camera is C, right? So this thing I showed you before, right? This camera, this infrared camera, that's what they see on the scene. They don't see that. That's what you see when you are in the world. That's what your camera sees. And the camera sees both of them twice, the same object, at two different positions. And by triangulating, so they can know where this object is with respect to the skull. The patient has been already calibrated with respect to the device using this screw that the patient has on his head, which are fixed, and that will be, will be used during the pre-operative scanning. We are going to do a scan of the patient as well before scanning. And we're going to send this information to the, to the, to the navigation system. And then you can link all of this together and at this point, if you don't um, untune the system, everything is linked now. And when you, when you actually move a device on the, on the patient, which could be a drill, which could be a scalper, then you can follow it and you can know in 3D where the head is and what is inside the head is with respect to this device. And using this type of tool, you can have a resolution, uh, an accuracy which will be roughly around up to 0.5 millimeter, which is pretty good for the type of technology uh, or the type of precision we want to achieve here. This is what I showed you before, and I was mentioning this, this thing here. That's the same thing. We use it to basically know where the skull is with respect to a tracking device. And here is the same thing with, with respect to the skull. And so once everything is calibrated, if I move now my device, if I move this stylet on the skull, I can actually see in real time on the computer with the stylet. 
So now that I've got this, I can do my surgery. Well, not me. Huh? My neurosurgeon can do the surgery. So the next short video is showing you actually the, the, the robot in action. So this is in the, in the situation of uh, brain biopsy, and we are currently doing it at Queen Square for epilepsy um, uh, for implantation. So this little robot takes a couple of minutes even less to be calibrated with this device with respect to the navigation system. And once it is calibrated, you can know exactly where you are, and then you can go safely into the brain and do what you have to do. In this case, it was about extracting a small carrot of, um, um, of, of tissue to uh, be able to do biopsy, uh, to do, excuse me, pathology, pathological information uh, to, to, to check if, for instance, this tumor was cancerous. So the future now, if, um, if, you, want to, um, if you want now to, to resect the patient, so let's consider that you, um, um, you have done all your analysis, you implant your patient, and you know exactly now this is this part of the brain. It could be the left temporal lobe, it could be um, one of the specific um, 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 area on the neocortex, and you know that you need to resect this area and only this area. You will not have huge morbidity associated with it and the patient will be seizure free. To do that, you need to plan as well. So what we've been developing as well is a software where you can link all of those information together again. So now you've got the 3D view of the patient, an MR scan, where you've got the implantation done. And here what you can see is what we call a video telemetry. So we can look at the patient during a seizure and we can see the burst happening in the brain and the different recording happening, and basically you can see the, the epileptic seizure propagation within the brain. And by combining all of this together, then you can have, you can have quite a good confidence about where is it coming from exactly within the brain of this patient. And once you know exactly where to go, then you can resect. So in this case, I'm showing you a real example uh, where we've been using all this implantation to identify the specific part in the frontal lobe, frontal lobe of the brain, and be able to actually resect it appropriately. And in this case, this patient was seizure free. A third of the cases of, um, of epilepsy are, are actually one, from one specific family, and they are called temporal lobe epilepsy. So your temporal lobes are these two things on the side here. And what happens is if the uh, um, uh, case on temporal lobe epilepsy, usually patients can be uh, quite, quite often eligible for surgery. So you would like to resect <coughs> one of these lobes. The challenge of those lobes is they contain this huge fiber bundle here. These fiber bundles are part of the optic radiation, which is going to become the optical chiasm and go to your eyes. Uh, that's what enables you to see. That's how you process the information going to your eye. The challenge here is you can see they are across. And in fact, what is on the left-hand side of your brain is processing for both sides. And what is on the right-hand side is as well processing for both sides. So if you resect a part of the temporal lobe and you make the patient seizure free, one of the quite common associated morbidity is that you've been resecting some of this optic radiation and you have lost of sight on both eyes. And usually it could be a full quadrant. So if you split your eye in four quadrants, if you resect some optic radiation, so some of the fibers, you might actually lose full sight on two of those quadrants of both eyes. And it could be actually two quadrants. It happens quite often. So that's quite debilitating for the patient. It's a huge morbidity associated with the surgery. And especially when we talk about kids, um, and that's basically just think for once about living your life without being able to see anything above, for instance. That's pretty terrible. So what we do in this case um, is, for instance, be able to take advantage of other technology, which are interventional MR information, being able to uh, exploit this very nice MR image of the brain during the surgery. The main reason we want to do this is this white matter fibers, this optic radiation, we cannot see it on anatomical data. You cannot see it when you open the brain. They don't look like spaghetti like I show you, that was histology. You don't see anything. And so what we want is to provide this information to your, to your surgeon during the surgery. So what we do is we, we use a technology called diffusion imaging when you can exploit uh, an algorithm called tractography to extract those spaghettis. Um, you've got them preoperatively and you want to bring them into the operating room. And you do that by scanning again the patient during the surgery using this modality, diffusion imaging, 
And in real time, we're going to match this information together, taking into account the fact that during the surgery, the brain is going to flat. It's going to have what we call a brain shift, and, and, and you will have to cope with it. And what I'm showing here is one of the tests we do usually after surgery, which is, which is called the Goldman perimetry. When you look at a laser within, within this globe, and if you can't see a point, that means that you lost uh, visual information on this area. So for instance, this is a drawing of a loss of the visual um, uh, left quadrant. Um, um. So what we want to avoid is exactly this. Is to, and this is really due to a surgery. So I'm, showing, I'm going to show you now a real example. This was done, uh, this was done at a time when we didn't have the information online in, within the operating room. This is a patient on the table which has been scanned. This is the optic radiation that you cannot see usually like this. This is after a part of the resection of the temporal lobe. You can see there is a missing part of the brain here. And you can see that the optic radiation is nearly touching the, the, uh, the interface. And actually, in this specific case, our surgeon didn't have the information and continue and carry on the surgery. And unfortunately, uh, uh, chop a part of the optic radiation. And in this case, unfortunately, the patient uh, had, had associated loss of, of, um, of sight. Um, since, we, since then, we implemented this into, um, into the uh, operating room. Uh, we use technology based on registration to be able to align this intraoperative data with preoperative information, to be able to propagate the information, and we then able to present on the microscope of the surgeon the information about where the optic radiation is, and then the neurosurgeon can use this information to avoid to resect the optic radiation. And we published this a few years back and demonstrating that we had no um, a loss of, of uh, sight for, uh, for our population, which was quite small at the time, 21 patients, uh, but uh, we've been explaining this so far. And this is now okay uh, a few years later. Uh, that was a, a newspaper uh, article on the 9th of October. Uh, we got more citation with a paper in the Daily Mail that you will never get uh, with a, a scientific paper. Uh, but um, uh, this lady uh, was a lady you saw before on the, on the video, and she's now full seizure free. She has never had a seizure since surgery. She, since then, she got married, and, uh, and she got a lovely kid. And I like the fact she called it a sat nav. We call it safety nav. I just would like to uh, finalize my talk by thanking my team, thanking our patients, and especially thanking uh, two great people uh, I've been working with for many years now, uh, Andrew McEvoy and John Duncan, so neurosurgeon and neurologist. And this is really um, a work of a multidisciplinary team, and this is where UCL is absolutely a fantastic place. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, for a very interesting and informative talk. So uh, we have time for a few questions, both from the audience here and uh, also from our uh, viewers uh, online. Would anyone like to begin? We have one gentleman here, please. Thank you. My initial reaction, apart from the superb work being done, is it's so disappointing that an American company has taken this on rather than one of the European ones. Um, Was this a question? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer this. Yes, well, how yeah. did that happen? We've got Siemens, we've got Philips, we've got other wonderful European countries. Mm. Um, Medtronic has a monopole pretty much uh, on uh, neurosurgical navigation uh, in the UK. Um, I think there is um, uh, over 28 systems in the UK so far. So um, my, uh, my aim in research is, uh, is impact. Uh, and I will work with anyone globally who has the lead to make sure technology is spread as much as possible. Uh, if uh, a company um, uh, a German company like Brainlab had more, more stake on neurosurgery and would be willing to work with us. I'm sure we could, uh, we could uh, uh, certainly talk with them. Uh, but uh, we have a fantastic relationship with Medtronic. Uh, as I say, they are the leader in neurosurgery. And um, it doesn't matter to me where they come from. Um, do we have another question from the theater? Um, Gentleman here, please. I uh, just wonder if you can tell me what languages you use to write. Uh, uh, C++. C++. Okay. 
Um, so, do we have a question coming online? Um, if you can wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Hello, this is a question via Slido, um, which is, so that's our online uh, audience watching via the live stream. What is needed to roll out this technology sort of across the board on a larger scale? So, so what you need is more evidence. You need to have it on many sites. So for instance, uh, one, of the, one of the current work we're doing is to go through what is called the MHRA, uh, which is our main body in the UK to be able to run clinical trials. And we are running the first uh, randomized uh, clinical trials, or what we call an RCT, um, in, in this area. And we're actually going through all the process at the moment and filing all of our information to be able to run it. Once you've got this in place, what you can get out of it is what it's called in medicine, uh, in surgery, a level one evidence. So you've got something which is very substantial, uh, which has been done using this randomized clinical trial, which will show the efficacy uh, the specificity, the sensitivity, the robustness of your technique, which will give, give enough confidence for Medtronic or another company, Striker, Renlab, whoever, to, to actually consider this is actually working really well and we want to exploit it and we want to distribute it globally. So we have some space for some other questions and I'd especially like to encourage some of our younger audience one young lady here, thank you. I had a question. Um, during the procedure, like the surgery, is there any, like, um, well, the obstacle would be, but I want to know if you'd seen any, like, epileptic seizure during the actual surgery and whether that plays a part in how it's carried out. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. So some, some surgery, not in this case, can be done awake. And then in this case, we look at the uh, ictal um, activity. You could actually eventually see the ectal activity. Um, but for, you know, in our case, the patient is fully sedated. And in this case, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no activity in the brain, pretty much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have another question from uh, our online audience? <laughs> They're being particularly quiet today. Attention. Yes. <laughs> so, do we have another question from the audience here? Um, if not, I think we can close because there's a class waiting to come in. And thank you all very much. And remember to come to the next lunchtime lecture on Tuesday. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>